Hello everyone, it's Scott and we're back with today's Dustmorn House of Horror spoiler video. We saw a lot of great cards from the PAX West preview over the weekend and we're going to talk about those cards. But before we dive in, remember to like and subscribe to get further content like this throughout Dustmorn House of Horror spoiler season. So let's dive in. So first we've got Volgarath, Terror Eater for 6 and 3 black mana. You legendary creature that's an Elder Demon with Fine and Light Flank and he's a 9-9. With Ward Sacrifice, 3 non-land permanents. If a card you didn't control would be put into an opponent's graveyard from anywhere, exile it instead. And during your turn you may play cards exiled with Volgarath. If you cast a spell this way, pay life equal to its mana value rather than pay its mana cost. So Volgarath, I don't think we're going to see this as a card people are trying to cast generally in standard, but I think this is going to be the top end of a reanimator style deck because if you can re get Volgarath into your graveyard, you reanimate him, it's going to be really hard for your opponent to win the game at that point. So this has the a feeling of Atraxa to me, and Atraxa turned out to be, you know, obviously one of the better standard cards we got last year. So I would expect Volgarath potentially has that same level of ability, and we've got a lot of good reanimation spells currently in standard, so I don't think it's going to be hard to get Volgarath out of the graveyard. So because of that, I think it's going to definitely see standard play in a graveyard strategy now with that it's also going to be a very good commander card because commander is going to love a card like this the nine mana um, in a reanimator style commander deck or even just a deck that is playing black this will be a great card in those in the ability to replay your opponent's spells, basically, with the abilities of Volgrath, I think in Standard and also in Commander and potentially other formats, that's going to be a really powerful ability. Next, we've got Demonic Council for one and a black mana. You get a sorcery and you can search your library for a demon card, reveal it, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So a way to go get Volgarath or another demon from the set. But the big piece of this is the delirium portion. And if there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard, instead search your library for any card, put it into your hand, then shuffle. So this is Demonic Tutor if you can meet that delirium requirement of four different card types in your graveyard, which I don't think is going to be very hard in standard. And certainly Commander, and I think even Pioneer, and potentially even down to modern, or they're going to look at this card as a great black card to play for for being able to go get whatever card you need at a given point in the game to do whatever it is that you want to to potentially win the game. So I think this is going to be a card that we're going to see across multiple formats of Magic. Next, we've got our Planeswalker for the set, and that's Kaido, Bane of Nightmares for two a blue and a black mana. You can ledger a planeswalker Kaido with four loyalty. And Kaido also has ninjutsu for one, a blue and a black mana. And you can return an unblocked attacker you control to hand and put this card onto the battlefield from your hand, tapped and attacking. And during your turn, as long as Kaido has one or more loyalty counters on him, he's a 3 4 ninja creature and has hex proof. So, very nice abilities here on Kaido. Before we even talk about his Planeswalker abilities, the Ninjutsu ability I think is going to be something that we'll see Kaido use to get him onto the battlefield a turn early, and that means you're going to get an extra activation of his loyalty abilities. And let's talk about those now to see what Kaido is going to do for us once we got him down as a Planeswalker. Well, his plus one, you get an emblem with ninjas you control, get plus one, plus one. And that's a static ability where every time every ninja is going to get that. And we do have a couple of ninjas still in standard. So I think because of that, that might be a relevant point moving forward. And for zero, he can surveil two and then draw a card for each opponent who lost life this turn. So obviously you'd be activating that post-combat, get that surveil ability, and then draw a card. And then for minus two, you can tap a target creature and put two stun counters on it. So you can basically take out the best creature your opponent has and put him in, in into a 
position where he's tapped and he's he has those two stun canners so he's not going to be relevant for the next two turns as well and that should help you with your game plan in terms of getting attacks through that might otherwise be stymied by a, the best creature your opponent has so i think kaido definitely is going to be a card we're going to see played in standard and i like that ninjutsu ability a lot and i think that may be what really makes this playable whether it's an esper deck or whether it's simply a demir deck that's going to use this I, but i think he is going to see definite standard play next we've got our first room of the day and it's uh, rooms are enchantments and in when it comes to rooms you can cast either half and that when you uh, pay the mana cost for one side of it you unlock that door and that door unlocks on the battlefield and as a sorcerer you may pay the mana cost of unlocking doors to unlock them so basically you probably in this particular situation you play dollmaker shop for for one and a white mana and that's going to be your initial play of this um, and whenever one or more non toy creatures you control attack a player, you get to create a 1 1 toy artifact creature token. And then in the late game, you then can unlock the other side of the card, which is Porcelain Gallery, for four into white mana. And then creatures you control have base power and toughness, each equal to the number of creatures you control. Which by the time we're playing Porcelain Gallery, probably we've got a pretty wide battlefield at this point so we're going to have every creature be five six seven eight power potentially and then you're swinging and hopefully winning the game right there so i think the rooms are going to be in an interesting part of dustworn standard and potentially going forward because you do get the advantage of being able to play both sides of the card during the course of the game next we've got Hauntwood Shrieker for one and two green mana. You get a Beast Mutant, that's a 3-3. Three, three. And whenever Hauntwood Shrieker attacks, manifests Dread, which means look at the top two cards of your library, put one of them onto the battlefield face down as a 2-2 two, two creature, and the other into your graveyard. Turn it face up any time for its mana value if it's a creature. And for one and a green mana, you can reveal target face down permanent, if it's a creature card, you may turn it face up. So really nice abilities on Hauntwood Shrieker. The Manifest Dread ability here I think is very powerful on this card. And I think we're likely to see a Gruul deck utilize this because we've already got from Murders at Karlov Manor a lot of cards that come in face down where, where they're using that disguise ability and that coupled with Huntwood Shrieker's ability here I think really puts you in a place where if you've got the right combination of things you can deal a tremendous amount of damage to your opponent just by flipping cards face up because we do have a card from murders at Karloff Manor that does that, or Lizard that does that. So I think we're, we're likely to see this in that style of deck, but I can see it really in a wide variety of decks where we just want to be able to push out extra cards consistently and simply by attacking, you're getting another creature every turn. And having those additional 2-2s on the battlefield can make a huge difference in winning and losing games. And again, that ability to turn things face up for only two mana really is going to allow you to cheat some cards into play. Next we've got Overlord of Mistmores for five and two white mana. You get an enchantment creature. That's an avatar horror. That's a six six with impending of four for two and two white mana. If you cast the spell for its impending cost, it enters with four time counters and isn't a creature until the last is removed. At the beginning of your end step, remove a time counter from it. So very powerful impending ability. And we've already talked about this in the initial preview video, where I think the impending ability is going to be very strong in this set particularly when it comes to these avatar horror creatures that we're going to see throughout the set. And you automatically get a, an ability when you play it for its impending cost. In this case, whenever Overlord of the Mistmores enters or attacks, you get to create two 2-1 two, white insect creature tokens with flying, which is a very nice ability for that four mana. You get two flyers in that case. And then as the 
game plays out, you remove those counters, and then you eventually have your 6-6. And the turn that it becomes a creature, you can also attack with it because it's already been on the battlefield. So you're going to get two more 2-1 two white insect creature tokens with flying when you attack. So I think this is a very, very powerful card. And the question is, do we have a deck that really is going to be a right fit for it for standard? I think in other formats like Commander, it's going to be a slam dunk card where people are going to want to play this. Next we've got split up for one and two white mana. You get a sorcery and you get to choose to destroy all tap creatures or destroy all untapped creatures. So I think this is the first time we've seen a board wipe um, in a while where you actually are going to use this as a card that's either going to wipe out your opponent's tapped creatures because they attacked on the previous turn or after you've attacked you're going to wipe out whatever's left on their side of the board because you're going to go ahead and destroy all the untapped creatures that your opponent has so because of that i think this is definitely a very playable card in standard and it'll be interesting to see how deck builders incorporate it into their strategies Next, we've got Enduring Innocence for one and two white mana. You get an enchantment creature that's a sheep glimmer and is a 2-1 with lifelink. And whenever one or more other creatures you control with power two or less enter the battlefield, draw a card. This ability triggers only once each turn. And when Enduring Innocence dies, if it was a creature, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control. It's an enchantment. So very powerful series of cards we're going to get from Dustborn, where you're going to get enchantment creatures that are glimmers and they're going to have an ability on them that is a solid ability in this case this is Takasia's welcome that's ability of when you cast a creature with power two or less then you get to draw a card and then if for some reason your opponent is able to kill enduring innocence then it's going to return to the battlefield and be an enchantment for you. So you're going to always get that activation. So I think that we will see these kinds of cards across standard decks because of their flexibility in giving you an advantage when they're a creature on the field and then also then later giving you that, that same advantage when they're just an enchantment. Next, we've got Razorkin Needlehead for two red mana. You get a human assassin. That's a 2 2. And Razorkin Needlehead has first strike during your turn. And whenever an opponent draws a card, Razorkin Needlehead deals one damage to them. So this is very reminiscent of Shialdra the Apocalypse's ability, where when you draw a card, you gain two life. And when your opponent draws a card, your opponent loses two life. So I, th I can see these two cards working together in a deck. And we've got a bunch of red and black cards now that just do incidental damage for playing the game. So I'm wondering if that incidental damage deck is one that we're going to see in standard in Rakdos Colors where you're basically penalizing your opponent for playing the game, doing a bunch of incidental damage throughout the course of the game. And because of that, I think that that might be a really powerful deck in standard. Next, we've got Peer Past the Veil for two, a red and a green mana. You get an instant and you get to discard your hand and then draw X cards where X is the number of card types among cards in your graveyard. So I think this is a very powerful green and red spell because normally we don't see this kind of spell in these particular colors. This is typically more of a blue spell. And because of that, in the mid to late game, anytime you're playing a Gruul deck, we do already have a solid Gruul Prowess deck. This is going to be a really nice card to be able to play in those situations where you're going to get three or four, maybe five cards in the mid to late game. And by doing so, you get to rebuild your hand and really put yourself in a position to beat your opponent when you were basically running out of cards in your hand. So I really like this. I think it's definitely playable in standard, but I think it's also going to be a card that we see in potentially Pioneer and maybe some other formats as well. Next, we've got Volgarath's Lair. It's an enchantment land with Hexproof and Volgarath's Lair enters tapped. As it enters, you get to choose a color, and then you can add one mana of the chosen color. Now, this doesn't seem like an exciting card, but this is an enchantment land. We're 
entering a set where enchantments matter. So because of that, I think this is going to be a land that is going to see a lot of play in standard because first thing it's going to avoid demolition field and other cards like that that destroy lands on the field but more importantly it's going to add to your enchantment count and i think we are going to see as the set progresses more cards that enchantments matter on them and as a result of that i think this is going to help those decks with their game plans Next, we've got the Jolly Balloon Man. For one, a red and a white mana. You get a legendary creature that's a human clown. He's a 1-4 with haste. And for one mana, you can create a token that's a copy of another target creature you control, except it's a 1-1 red balloon creature in addition to its other colors and types, and it has flying and haste. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Activate only as a sorcery. So this is one of those cards that's either going to be really good or terrible. And in a deck where you're going to be copying cards that have good enter the battlefield triggers i think this is a very solid card in that kind of deck but outside of that creating a 1-1 haste creature with flying isn't all that great um, so i don't think that in a normal deck this is going to matter i think it's going to have to be something where you enter the battlefield triggers are strong, strong enough where you're going to want to do those over and over again and because of that, I think it's got limited standard playability. Next, we've got Zimone, all questioning. For one, a green and a blue mana, you get a legendary creature that's a human wizard and is a 1-1. One, one. At the beginning of your end step, if a land entered the battlefield under your control this turn and you control a prime number of lands, create Primo, the Indivisible, a legendary 0-0 green and blue fractal creature token, then put that many plus one plus one counters on it. So I, Zimone to me is one of the more interesting cards we got from the day because I can see Zimone having a significant impact on the game if you're getting to activate Primo. And getting, you know, playing Zimone on turn, you know, three or four, and then on turn five, you would get a 5-5 five, five Primo. I think that's reasonable enough to say this is playable in Standard. But the ability activating again later, I think, might make this potentially one of the sleeper cards from the set. Because a lot of times, if you're playing a green and uh, blue deck, you're going to be at 7 to 10 to 11 land by the time the game is over. So because of that, you're going to get more and more activations of Primo. And it is legendary, but that's okay because what I see Primo as being is the ultimate blocker or attacker in the game where you're just attacking in, trying to do as much damage as possible, knowing that you're going to play that next land and get another copy of it if he dies. And because of that, I think Zimone has some standard playability. We got Winter Misanthropic Guide for one, a black, a red, and a green mana. You can legend a creature that's a human warlock and is a 3-4 with ward 2. And at the beginning of your upkeep, each player draws two cards. It has delirium. As long as there are four or more card types among cards in your graveyard, each opponent's maximum hand size is equal to seven minus the number of those card types. So I can see, you know, Winner, if we do get a Jun style deck in standard, I can see Winner as a part of that because that extra card draw is really powerful, but more importantly, limiting how many cards your opponent can have in their hand at any given time is also a very powerful ability in standard. And a lot of times, you know, if outside of our aggro strategies, most players are going to have three, four, five cards in their hand in the mid game. So because of that, winner could become very, very powerful because if your opponent can't play those cards on their turn, they're going to have to discard them. And because of that, I think winner has some playability in a Jun deck in standard. But maybe where winner is going to be at its strongest is in commander where you're likely to be able to do this and really affect how many cards each of your opponents has. Next, we've got some lower rarity cards for the day that I think have some 
standard playability. So the first is Scrambling Skull Crab for a blue mana. It's a 0-3 Skull Crab. And it has Eerie whenever an enchantment you control enters. And whenever you fully unlock a room, target player mills two cards. So this is our mill card for the set. And we already know that we've got um, the Jace that mills cards already from Phyrexia All will be one. So I think those two cards together may give us the ability to have some kind of mill style deck. And we don't know what else we're going to see from Dustmourne. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see other mill cards in the set. So it'll be interesting to see where this fits in, if at all, in standard. Next, we've got Veteran Survivor for one white mana. You get a 2-1 Human Survivor. And it has Survival, which is one of the new mechanics from the set. And at the beginning of your second main phase, if Veteran Survivor is tapped, exile up to one target card from a graveyard. And as long as there are three or more cards exiled with Veteran Survivor, it gets plus three, plus three, and has Hexproof. So this is a card that I think has a lot of potential in Standard. We already have a human deck in Standard. So this easily fits into that deck as another 2-1 to put in there. But that ability to attack and then exile a card from your opponent's graveyard or even your graveyard to then hopefully bump it up to a 3-3, I think is really powerful. Because if you've got a 5-4 for one mana, that's really powerful, not only in Standard, but in all kinds of different formats. So this is a card I think we need to keep an eye on for aggro decks and just decks in general in Standard. Next, we've got Noreen Swift Survivalist for a red mana. You get a legendary creature that's a human coward and is a 2-1. And Noreen Swift Survivalist can't block. And whatever creature you control becomes blocked, you may exile it. You may play that card from exile this turn. So Noreen's an interesting card. We don't really kind of see this ability very much in Standard, where if a creature gets blocked, you have the ability to exile it. And if you do exile it, then you can replay it. So basically, you can protect a card in combat. And I like that ability on Noreen, but I don't know if that makes it good enough to see Standard play. Next, we've got Unwanted Remake. For a white mana, you get an instant where you get to destroy target creature and its controller manifests dread. So that player looks at the top two cards of their library, then puts one of them on the battlefield face down as a 2-2 creature and the other into their graveyard. If, if it's a creature card, it can be turned faced up anytime for its mana value. So cheap instant speed, white removal, any time in the game. Now the downside is you are giving your opponent a 2-2, but that could also be a 2-2 two -two that is an important card for your opponent. So I think this is definitely standard playable. We'll see how much white decks want to play it. Next we've got Disturbing Mirth for a black and a red mana. You get an enchantment and when Disturbing Mirth enters the battlefield you may sacrifice another enchantment or creature. If you do, draw two cards. So nice draw ability there. Typical black, red, racto sacrifice ability. And when you sacrifice Disturbing Mirth, manifest dread. So maybe you play a second copy of this and then you manifest dread. So you're going to get a 2-2 two -two when you do this, plus the two cards from Disturbing Mirth. So I like this card in the right Rakdos deck. The question is, are we going to have that right deck to make it standard playable? Next, we've got some of our fear cards. So fear is going to be one of the themes of the set where you're going to have cards that are fear of a wide variety of things. And these are a couple of examples of those. And I think the fact that they're all nightmares may be relevant in standard as we progress throughout the course of the set. So our first one is fear of immobility for four and a white mana. You get an enchantment creature. That's a nightmare. And it's a four, four. And when fear of immobility enters, tap up to one target creature. If an opponent controls that creature, you need to put a stun counter on it. So tap their best creature, stun it for a turn. So nice ability, definitely limited playable, but probably not beyond that. Next, we've got fear of lost teeth. For a black mana, you get a 1-1 enchantment creature. That's a nightmare. 
and when fear of lost teeth dies it deals one damage to any target and you gain one life so all these fear cards are going to have some activated ability on them either when they come into play or when they die and i think that's going to make for some interesting limited play those are our cards from dustmorn for today so we saw a lot of interesting cards. I think there's going to be a lot of cards from today that have the potential to have standard playability. And thanks for staying to the end of the video. You can take a look at my video for the original Dustmorn previews from over the summer. You can check that out right here by clicking on the um, link to that. And I will be back tomorrow with more Dustmorn House of Horror spoilers. Thanks for staying to the end of the video, and I'll see you next time.